Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And I'm going to ask Bill to make his way over to the front if he can. The 2016 Canadian Digital Media Pioneer Award goes to Bill Buxton uh, for his work in the field of human-computer interaction. Following a 20-year career as a professional musician, Bill transitioned into a researcher and interaction designer and was a professor with both the University of Toronto and the Technical University of Eindhoven. He worked at Alias Research and SGI uh, and now works at Microsoft. Bill has devoted over three decades to improving the human factors of technology and advocating for the importance of design in digital media products and systems. Bill is well known for his work in multi-touch systems and interface designs for computer music systems and for design. His early research paved the way for the trackpads and touchscreens that we use today. Named one of the top five designers in Canada by Time Magazine, Bill has received four honorary doctorates, is co-recipient of an Academy Award for Scientific and Technical Achievement, received an ACM uh, Sig Chai Lifetime Achievement Award, and is a fellow of ACM. Uh, I uh, met Bill years ago, and uh, we worked together with our school uh, during the uh, Massive Change exhibition. But when I was at the Design Exchange, um, I got the chance uh, to invite him to speak to the Industrial Design Conference that we organized, the ICSID Conference. And when I looked at his website, for me this was a kind of revelation. It was uh, an ongoing list of patents uh, that he had there, uh, which uh, really exposed to me the amount of work that he's done and the amount of innovation that he's done uh, for uh, uh, people and uh, really, in essence, for all of us uh, in developing technology. Bill is the author of Sketching User Experiences. I, I have the privilege of seeing an early draft of that. And he's a relentless advocate for innovation, design, and especially the consideration of human values and culture in the conception and implementation of new products and technologies. He has worked with some of the best-known companies like Xerox Park, Apple, and now Microsoft Research as the principal researcher, where his job description is to make a difference. Bill's work has always been ahead of its time, and uh, he especially understands how long it takes, the 20-year the innovation cycle, uh, that it takes for an innovation to be adopted into society. We'd now like to share a short video. thought a lot about digital or any other technology. The primary thing was what was taking what I knew as a human and what the needs were and then looking around the world in terms of technologies as to what was there that I could avail myself of to, to make better tools. And, um, and sometimes it was digital and sometimes it was birch bark. And it just doesn't matter. I mean, it's what's appropriate. thing about design is that nothing is new. If you know the history and you know the history of design in your discipline, the answers are there and they can be harvested if you know how to do your research and, and prospect. Um, well, it's really a great honor to be here to uh, recognize Bill as a digital pioneer. Uh, you know, as you saw in the video, Bill began his career as a professional musician. And I always thought that, and when I first met him, you know, I thought he brought this sort of artist's perceptiveness and attention to detail that really only comes, you know, from, from, from the art world side. And really specifically, it was his deep appreciation for understanding the physical nature of interacting with computers. And that personally really resonated with, with me at, at the time. But what I found over the course of the decades that I've known Bill is that sort of simple approach to it, you know, literally allowed him to uh, accurately either invent or predict what was going to happen in the future. And that was really the uh, genius of Bill. Uh, as you saw, for example, his early work on the digital music sy sy systems was simply amazing from somebody who came from a musical background like myself. There were these guys using, you know, synthesizers. Uh, and at the time, we thought that was cool. Now when I look back, I go like, wow, that was many years ahead of its time. And we all saw 
you know, the audio world turned into the digital music world, and that had profound effects. And Bill was right there at the start in the late 70s. Uh, and in that effort to build these really cool music sy systems, uh, just as almost a side effect, you know, Bill broke ground on creating some of the earliest multi-touch systems that were not only multi-touch, but also explored the use of pen and gesture. Uh, and, you know, it's completely remarkable when I thought about it that after 30 years, I'm speaking to an audience where some of Bill's thoughts are actually probably in your pockets now. And there, I think there's very few people that we can say, say that about. Uh, in a similar way, uh, he did brilliant work on research on telepresence. And he really showed how the subtleties, how you need to capture the subtleties of human to human interaction to really make these systems work. And in some ways, with remote telepresence, the jury's still out on that. I'm still waiting for some features that I saw from the telepresence project uh, to appear in current sy systems as of, as of today. Uh, for myself, I spent a large part of my career working directly with Bill at Alias here in Toronto. Uh, and there, I thought B Bill was really great at predicting many of the techn technical innovations that would follow in filmmaking. And that was part of our jobs at, at that time. Uh, and, you know, I remember sort of the height of that was in the late, the late 90s. Uh, and s specifically, there are things now that which, you know, on the movie sets, we're, we're starting to see that are being taken for, for granted. Things like pre-production digital visualization, uh, on-set motion capture. Back in the old days, motion capture was this, oh, if we got to do motion capture, I guess we will do it. You know, now it's a staple of the way people wanted to work. Uh, and things like real-time virtual cameras, uh, they're now used on sets as opposed to being sort of a post-processing thing. Uh, and those were all things, like I said, that was, that was back in the late, late 90s that we were talking about with, within the research group. And Bill was really focused and realized that that was the direction that a lot of the technology in the movie industry was going to go. So the proof was 10 years later, I was at home watching the documentary of uh, the making of the Avatar, uh, making of the movie Avatar, and I saw the technology, this sort of moving virtual camera that we had built in the lab you know, 10 years prior to that, and James Cameron had used it to full effect. And, you know, it was just a really stunning example that, you know, you, you can, through research, really experience the future quite a few years ahead of time. I would also really be remiss if I didn't mention the other great creations from Bill. Uh, as a professor, he's left a thriving community of graduate students who he supervised. Um, and I'm sure all of us former students could agree that above all, uh, Bill served as a real ins inspiration to us, but also in a really specific way. Uh, you know, I really remember the feeling of discussing with Bill a research project that perhaps wasn't working, and he really was the absolute master of convincing me that, yes, I was on the right track, propping me up and sending me back out there. Uh, and so that was a, you know, a, a great talent. And it was really sort of this type of unconditional and intellectual support that, that allowed Bill to, to, to create and inspire these generations of graduate, uh, great graduate researchers. And it created a legacy of hundreds of research papers, uh, literally making a name for Toronto and Canada as a place with the world's best human computer interaction research. So Bill, you are a crazy pioneer, man, a great researcher, wonderful showman, and a humanist, and a, his, and a historian all rolled up into one. Uh, you're someone who always puts humans first before money, ideas before ownership, and one of the few men who has the amazing gift of clear vision to see the forest from the trees over and over again. Uh, it's been an honor to be part of the uh, expedition. Congratulations, man. Um, so I'm just going to fill in a few details. That many of the things that um, I would like to say can't really be said in public. So. Um, I, I'll say that um, I started my uh, career at the University of Toronto in um, a past century. Uh, it was, I think, 1981, and Bill was my Master's of Science supervisor. I think I was among his first two um, graduate students. And our first paper together was on gesture. 
And it's very interesting to think about a, a, a small theme to what I'm going to develop here is over the last 35 years, um, there's not been that much new under the sun in terms of the fundamental human computer interaction problems that we've really been looking at, except that a lot of the problems now are um, designated for things that sit in your pocket. Uh, so in 1981, um, a graphics display consisting of 512 pixels by 512 pixels by about the same color resolution that we have now. So that's, that would actually be a small kind of thumb size thing on your display, on current uh, handheld displays. Such units with a really small CPU would cost $100,000. So if you think about you know, the Moore's Law and what that's done and the influence of um, close to the iron technologies that, that are really required for interactive computing, you can, you can get a sense of just the amazing progress technologically that's happened. But none of that would be useful without the development of techniques that allow people to stay close to machines and actually get interesting things done. Everything in computer science is in fact a, is in fact a subset of HCI. Computers don't do things for their own good. They do things presumably on behalf of people. And those things, those problems they, they, they work on, uh, are done on really our, our behalf, whether it's prosthetically or in background or whatever. So in 1981, VR was, um, well, head-mounted displays were already 15 years old. So this idea of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality was already there. Uh, it was hyped just about as much as it, as it is now. Um, and, and, and it's still searching for very interesting problems. Uh, so I think right now what we're seeing is potentially a, uh, something that wasn't there in 1981 namely the, um, uh, the use of, uh, the, really the business models for, for uh, virtual reality. But one thing Bill did, um, in, I think the music, the music uh, background that I guess Gord and Bill and I share, uh, really I think gave him insights into some really fundamental ways of interacting as Gord has mentioned. First, the very notion that pressure can be used in devices was very important. That may have come from keyboards, but perhaps uh, Bill will talk about that. Uh, Multi-touch multi -touch systems were already in existence in our lab back then that, that Bill co-led. I was a, just a fledgling student. Uh, and in seeing the progress of a lab, you can draw some musical analogies. Um, in a lot of ways, it, the, our lab was very improvisational, but patterns developed and some very interesting technologies developed because, in fact, Bill and his colleagues encouraged this idea of just exploring, bringing things back, having kind of a demo-based approach to things. Yes, we often did theory, but we wanted to bring it into practice as well. And recognizing that, um, I think one of Bill's most inspirational things for me was that individual talents could contribute in, in um, synergistic ways. Having artists in the lab was very important, having engineers, scientists, um, sociologists, other people who both work empirically, but other people who work theoretically or intuitively and so on. And Bill orchestrated in some sense, he was the band leader for that kind of, that kind of thing. So over the years, I, I guess I veered more into what I, I guess we would call the mo more mathematical side of computer graphics. But the early days were very influential for me because all of the the, the knobs and variables and degrees of freedoms that, that, that you have, that you're exposed to when you do physical modeling need some kind of human interface, some way to project all of those variables into something usable, something that regular folks can use and express themselves with. And that idea of controlling variables with, a, with multiple channels but keeping the complexity managed in reasonable ways was really something that was inspired, that I found inspirational in Bill's work. So there are many other things I could say, but as, as I said, many of them can't be mentioned in public. Uh, perhaps at the reception we can, we can talk about some more scandalous things that, that we've all been up to over the years. But I, I, it, it's really a great honor to be able to be a part of this particular introduction and to thank Bill for his contributions, certainly to the world at large, but also very personally, and how he's affected me. Thank you. So somebody asked me how many slides I had in my talk, and since 
it's about new media, I wanted to emphasize something and not use any slides to reinforce the notion that the voice is also a medium and that it doesn't have to be digital, although I will slap my fingers if you want something digital. So, of course, I, I'm not going to say what I was going to say because of what those guys just said. Um, I, I, I can't help but be influenced by the people around me. I have no self-discipline. Um, that's one of the things that Eugene didn't mention. Um, I have a definition of the act of creativity, and it is a recent um, reflection, and since I think that's what, what I'm going to say has to do with, I'll tell it to you, and it will make sense out of my career. Creativity, the act of creativity, is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. And most favorite kind of innovation and creativity is what I would call surprising obviousness. It's the kind of thing when you see great design or great ideas where you say, you recognize them instantly. And you have to ask yourself, how on God's earth can you recognize something you've never thought of before, you've never seen before, and yet you can still recognize it? In a way, it's because it's obvious. Its form and its placement and its presentation is such that everything about it is known. It's not hard. And the funny thing about it is, is that when you see something that's obvious, um, you no longer own it because it's obvious. And I think that this is a really important part. Um, Gord said something, or maybe it was Eugene, something about selfless. It's not a question of being selfless. I think the first thing that we have to understand if we want to make progress is that great ideas are a dime a dozen. There are no such thing as precious ideas. And my experience, and there's got to be some benefits for being old, because if you get something like this, it means you're old. Um, I have grandchildren now and stuff like that, is that maybe you learn something along the way. And the thing is this, is that of the people I've known who've tried to voraciously protect their ideas as their own, none of them have reached their potential in terms of what they could have done, in my opinion. And the most important thing to realize, and I don't care if you're talking about Darwin or me or anyone else, we're part of a chain. And the reason I was able to do what I did when I came to Toronto was because of the people there before, a guy named Les Mezzi and a guy named Ron Becker. And, and if I trace back, Becker came from a guy named Wes Clark, who set up the lab at Lincoln Lab, at, which is where Ivan Sutherland was, which is where Sketchpad was. And you can go the opposite direction. And as soon as you say, all I can do is be a prospector for great ideas, recognize the patterns, and then contribute something that's worthy to improve them, that's all you can ask for. And then it stops trying to be, I'm the inventor of this. Yes, I think we published the first paper um, on capacitive multi-touch, but absolutely we weren't the first to do it. Um, there was somebody at Bell Labs that's the first I'm aware of, but touch went back years before. The first touch screen was already commercially, capacitive touch screen was already in place in air traffic control at Gatwick Airport by 1967. Just in case you didn't want to know how old touch screens are. <clears throat> by the way, the trackball was invented in Mississauga um, and was made out of a Canadian bowling ball, the very first touch ball. It was air supported uh, by Ferranti. If you want the interaction coming from Toronto. So let's, so let's talk about this for a minute. Um, there's in some ways, what I do, I, I guess, is it's research, but it's also design. And I want to talk about that because creativity and design are associated. And I want to talk a little bit about design, maybe in a way to, um, maybe it's not about design thinking, but let's think about design. And for me, always, design is really simple. Design, if you give a one-word definition, design is choice, period. 
And there's only two places for creativity in design, which are the same two places, obviously, where there's room for creativity and choice. And by the way, I hate people bifurcate, and so it's really counter, uh, it's, it's against my grain to even say there's only two, but I think there are only two. One is the creativity that you bring to enumerating the things from which you choose. And it seems to me that's where experience design everything comes to and where the breadth of your curiosity, the breadth of your experience, and when I say your, I don't mean you individually, but you and your environment, the people you choose to have around you. In that collective experience, that collective knowledge, what is the repertoire of things, you dis of meaningfully distinct things that you choose to choose from among uh, the, the candidates from which you will choose? And the second place for cre where creativity plays a hold is in the heuristics or the processes, the rationale that you use to make choices from amongst those things. And of course, it's iterative. And as soon as you break that down, you're sort of saying, well, man, I'm making choices. So what are the criteria? Why did you make those choices? And why did you choose from amongst those things? So when they talk about lateral thinking, lateral thinking is simply the bonus type of thing, is simply going into different spaces to bring in candidates that weren't obvious ahead of time, but they might have been obvious in retrospect when you find out you missed the most important thing. And so there's two parts here is that the, and this applies to the whole design of anything, including the design of your life, but also the design of your product, the design of your group, the design of your culture. The same processes can work. And so now we come down to this notion that, that if you realize that anything you designed is in fact a technology by the general definition of technology, including people, including my voice right now, is a technology, it's a voice. How I choose to use it, the construct, the use of language is a technology, it's a learned over, developed over years. I have a historian of technology who's one of my heroes, his name is Melvin Kranzberg. Gordon has certainly, I think, and George and, and, and Eugene probably have heard me talk about this guy years, over, over the years, because he's, I'd never hardly ever give a talk without mentioning him. His name is Melvin Kranzberg. And you've probably never heard of him. But Melvin Kranzberg said something really brilliant that's always stuck with me. He said, technology is not bad, technology is not good, but nor is it neutral. It will be some combination of good and bad. And that struck me when a woman, Gail Morris, a sociologist who worked with me on the Telepresence Project, when she gave me that to read, that never left me. It was one of the most influential papers I ever read from somebody I'd never heard of and I've never encountered since from anyone else. I'm lucky that I had a sociologist working with me. Um, remember what I said about having a broad base of experience to contribute to your thinking? There's a, there's a classic example. Now, Kranzberg's second law is really interesting and it says that invention is the mother of necessity. Now, at the moment, I have to criticize my two ex-students and friends and colleagues um, because they didn't mention the most important part of what I think is my character and what's the secret of my success, and that is my incredible sense of humor. <laughs> and um, the reason I like that statement from uh, Kranzberg is I simply love plays of words. I love bad puns, and I love the fact that he took Instead of saying necessity is mother of invention, he flipped it around and turned the head and that makes you think about it. But I, that, that humor part is actually really important, even though I haven't made many good jokes yet. I'll work on it. But the point is this, is that Oscar Wilde, I thought this, this remember, this is the thing I said, I thought I invented this. I thought it was really clever until my boss, Rick Rashid at uh, Microsoft, he founded Microsoft Research, said, you didn't invent that, that's Oscar Wilde. And I looked it up and damn it, it was Oscar Wilde. See, never say you're first. Never say you invented something. Say, um, I had this thought, it, I think it's pretty neat. That's all you can say. And the thing is that in the world today, around technology, we're dealing with things which are really hard, increasingly hard, partially as a consequence of the very technologies and designs that we are making. And they're really important and according to Kranzberg's first laws, they're not all right. And therefore, everything needs to be questioned because of, of um, 
the, the consequences. And so as soon as we start using words like good, bad, right, wrong, and so on, you have to beg the question according to what criteria. And if you can't articulate the rationale and the reasons you made these decisions and the value systems that lie behind them, you're flying blind. And you cannot anticipate the unexpended, unexpected consequences of those decisions. And, and I think this is the, the thing. We get in this world right now, we are so obsessed with gadgets, the newest gadget, the newest this or that, that we don't step back and say, but why and what are we doing? I'll give you an example. I, I was at a hackathon not long ago, and one of the entries was a system that was on your mobile phone that would let you know what food was in your fridge that was about to go bad and what to do with it. And so you could have recipes and stuff like that, and, or food, and, we've, and I, just for fun, I binged, that's the equivalent of Google for those of you who don't speak Microsoft. Um, I binged um, fridges, food, mobile phones, and applications, and got pages of results. And I'll just draw this to your attention. Think about this for a minute. You have electricity? You have a fridge? You have food? You have so much food in your fridge you don't know what to do with it? And you think you need an application on a computer to deal with your hardship? You poor person. Go to West Africa, go to you know, three quarters of the world, and they'll just look at you and say, what is going on? And you went through how many years of school to make an app and to develop the skills, and that's what you chose to do with it. And I'm not trying to be heavy and stuff like that, but the point is, the whole issue around these technologies was, and you hear it, if you watch Silicon Valley, you know this, because it's a documentary and not a, a fictional TV show. It just happens to be the rendering. Was it Toon, a Toon Shader was at play? Everybody says, I'm trying to build this stuff to make the world a better place. Bullshit. That's delusional. That's hubris. And the question is, what is important? What are your values? And ultimately, it comes down to one thing. In my opinion, if you want to be successful, if you want to have a long-term career, if you don't feel like, and, and if you want to get over this thing where you feel like you're a failure, if you're not a millionaire by the time you're 25, if you don't, if you just step back from all of that and say, what's important? And the only technology worth studying to find that out is the human being itself, is the human. What do you believe as a human? What do you value? What is important to you in culturally, ethically, and so on? I don't see how you can design and have a sustained career that you're going to be happy with when you're my age if you're not taking that into account. And it changes everything. And the neat thing is, if you get out of the bubble and you start to hang out with people who are musicians, artists, sociologists, architects, um, doctors, um, farmers, whatever, for me, birch bark canoe builders, I learned, you know, you, you start getting some hubris about our new technologies, go learn how to go to the woods with a knife and a hatchet and build a birch bark canoe that you'll take on a thousand kilometer trip and, and trust it and realize it's better than any technology you can make today. And the engineers 6,000 years ago were way smarter in terms of materials than, than we are today or just as smart. Then you start to get this respect for these things that are cultural, embedded, and have real value. What I would argue is this. Anything I have done, and this is not false modesty, not only does it build on the shoulders of, of giants, but it's a result of seeing patterns, and it's a result of my primary, the thing I'm most proud of, and the thing that I've worked the hardest at, is the people I chose to work with. And the design of my team, the design of the culture we created in that team, where humor is part of it, right? The thing about Oscar Wilde that I haven't told you yet is these things are far too important to take seriously. How can you think creatively if you've got a pickle shoved up your butt? You're so uptight. You've got to be loose. You've got to play. Play is the most fundamental thing around these things when you're playing with ideas. And, but it's serious play. But you have to have that relaxed thing where everybody's team and nobody has ownership. 
Oh yeah, of course you have ownership. You have ownership or you're part of it because in every team, because it's a heterogeneous social network, everyone has their own expertise. And by Eugene having expertise in math in our group, it freed the rest of us, uh, it let me get away with being a math illiterate, as long as the bases were covered. So here's the deal. The dirty little secret of highly accomplished people is what they've neglected in order to become highly accomplished. It's really, really hard to be really good at one thing. This is a point made to me by a f famous composer, one of my heroes named Yanis Anakis. And, and, and he said, when I was whining about it, it was hard to be a computer scientist and uh, to do the technology side and the music side. He says, Bill, what are you complaining about? He just like, shut up, stop whining. It's hard enough to be expert at one thing. So just if you can even begin to do two things, just count yourself lucky and stop whining. But, but the problem is we need to do more than two things. And yet the Renaissance is over. The Renaissance man or woman are no longer possible. But the Renaissance team is absolutely possible. And if we believe what I'm saying about the breadth of experiences, but remember Jimi Hendrix asked the most fundamental question for experience design. Are you experienced? And why would you expect if your base of experience is that narrow that you're gonna be any good and have any uh, at experience design? As an individual, you can widen it a bit, but by the people you surround with the diverse skills, collective experience of the team, you all of a sudden can cover a way broader set of bases and you have a chance of your collective visions to get that ethical compass mark right, to, get, to basically get the value systems and the considerations that will get you a better solution. And yet it will never be perfect because Kranzberg's law is volatile and so you will still have to clean up your mess afterwards, but it will be a much smaller mess and far more likely to be on a path that you can live with and, and recover from. So the fundamental thing I would say is this. The most important design technological decision you're gonna make is who do you work with? What's the problem? What is the work culture of that team? How do you work together? And then collectively, why are you doing it? And what are your values? And you make this list about what do we believe? Uh, Gord, uh, George will tell you. What do we believe? Whether it's a technical thing, our belief systems, we always just write them down so that we check always against that. And if we come to something we can't reconcile, then you get in discussion because you've made it explicit and you revise the belief or refine it. But you never go against the list at its current state. And you're allowed to have questions left. So I think that if you do that and things work together, among other things, we might actually start to make devices instead of, I mean, we might be able to start designing ecosystems as opposed to gadgets so that that same ecosystem that we have in the social amongst the people, we might be able to start designing technologies that also work together within and seamlessly within the society. The fundamental qu point, and this is where I'm gonna end, I don't mean to preach, but I come by it my honestly, I guess my father was a preacher. He actually he hated it if I called him a preacher, but he was a priest. But the, generation that I came from, and then Eugene and Gord, people say, you're really lucky because you're there early on, you can do all this fundamental stuff, all this important things are happening. No, 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 no. We got the easy stuff. We got the low-hanging fruit. You've got the mess that we created. It's a nice mess to play in. Don't get me wrong, mud pies are great, but it's, it's still there. But on the other hand, we weren't sure what could be done. It was a miracle that computers even worked. It was a miracle that the synthesizer worked. It was a miracle the first graphic systems we made. The fact that I, you were talking about going to Montreal, twice my synthesizer caught on fire on stage in Montreal. Montreal, every time I went there, my synthesizer caught on fire. It was just, and, and we recovered, right? And I'm just, so I told you I'd make you laugh at least once, but that, except that wasn't even a joke, that was true. Um, but today, here's what's in front of you. If you understand that you're part of a continuum, and you understand the larger values, and you step back and think about what I'm saying, you can take advantage of the most powerful thing that you have that we didn't have, and that is this. You can do anything technologically now. There's almost nothing that you can imagine right now that cannot be done. So the question I'll leave you with, as opposed to an answer is, now you can do anything what should you do? Not what could you do, what should you do? 
And if you can answer what that is and why, and live with yourself, then get on with it and say, okay, now, who do I need to add to my team? And what environment do I need to make it done? And then you will make everything we've done collectively, amongst Eugene, Gord, myself, pale and considerate in, in, in comparison. And that is the hugest piece of power I can help point you, put in your hands, or say that I can imagine. There's nothing better. But as Uncle Ben said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility, and it's on your shoulders. Thank you.